Hello, listeners. Welcome to another episode of Cognitive Dissidents. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. I don't have a whole lot of prelude today. Sim is back on the podcast. We talk about the Russia-Ukraine war, what the last 12 months have brought us, what the next 12 months hold in store. And then we look around the world and try and figure out where are the hotspots that people aren't talking about in 2024. Uh, if you want to talk to me about what we do at CI or you want to recommend books or you want to talk about the podcast, my email address is jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers. Take care of the people you love. And I will see you out there. All right, Sim, welcome back to the show. Um, you know, it's it's January 2024 now, so I've been spending a lot of time thinking back to last year and where we were at this time last year. Um, and in some ways, not a lot has changed, but things have changed significantly in Ukraine. Um, I was pretty optimistic around this time last year that Ukraine was had the upper hand in the war with Russia and that things were going well and that Russia wasn't going to be able to keep it up. We fast forward to this week, uh, and I'm more pessimistic than I've been about Ukraine's chances really since the invasion started. Um, you know, you can you can go and Google articles all you want. The New York Times had an article this morning, exhausted on the defensive and at hell's gate in Ukraine, just talking about, I mean, really painting a grisly picture of, um, I don't want to call it trench warfare. They were calling it ping pong warfare with some of the Ukrainian forces they were talking to that each side, you know, sort of takes some land, takes it back. Um, but really, I mean, you've got Ukrainian troops on a 600 mile front. Um, and they're, lo- they're no longer on the offensive. They're even defending themselves from probing Russian attacks. So um, as always, I was hoping you could help us make sense of this. Um, I don't know exactly where to start. W- where do you want to start? H- how do you think we should start by looking at this conflict? Is, is that pessimism about Ukraine's position right? Are you feeling a little bit more optimistic? Um, w- what is your overall assessment of how things have gone the last 12 months from Ukraine's perspective? Well, I, I think there's different ways to look at um how things have evolved in 2023. Um, the big thing that everybody obviously has noted, and that is probably dominating the assessments of, of um, success or lack of success in Ukraine, uh, is the fact that when you look at where the front lines were coming out of the winter, um, 2022, 2023, um, and you compare those to the front lines now, they look very similar. There's, there's very very tiny changes here and there, but but nothing um, that reshapes the conflict. Um, and of course, that goes paired with the the ambitions, the expectations of the so-called summer offensive that Ukraine was going to conduct, um, which I, th- I think officially was started somewhere in July. Um, but in the end, we we saw some gains in uh, very limited sectors, uh, especially. Uh, in the south, around towns like Robotine and um, uh, closer to Donetsk, but essentially we we didn't see those front lines being broken and big thunder runs as we saw in in Kharkiv the year before, um, and and that kind of um, you know has suppressed the mood, I would say. Um, but I think it's important to look beyond the lines on the map and to also look at what uh, has actually changed through that summer offensive through the year. And one of the big things that happened there, of course, is the increased levels of attrition that Russia has had to deal with. Um, So during that summer offensive, as well as throughout the entire year, uh, the numbers of casualties that Russia has suffered, so um, dead and wounded uh, soldiers, um, as well as losses of equipment, um, has been much higher than it had been in 2022. And let's not forget that 2022 started off with that massive peak already, uh, where during the initial movement phase of the conflict, Russia kind of sacrificed a lot of its equipment and troops in uh, in hopeless attempts to, to extend deep into Ukraine. So I think when you add all of those things up, yes, 2023 was a failure to break through those those current front lines, but the war has evolved over the course of the year to the disadvantage of Russia. Has Russia lost? I mean, it seems to me that a war of attrition favors Russia because Russia has more soldiers and has more ability than Ukraine to produce ammunition. 
um, and arguably has more ability to produce uh, ammunition for Ukraine than the Europeans have shown, maybe even the Americans, although the Americans have surged some of their production for some of these things. They also have Israel, which now wants a lot of weapons too. So I, I take your point that Ukraine's been able to score some wins against Russia, but have the wins been big enough to balance Ukraine's disadvantage in an attritional fight, or am I wrong about um, who gains from an attritional fight? There's a, a couple little things there that I, I think I want to dispute a little. Um, when, when we're talking about Russia having the deeper pockets in a, a war of attrition, um, there is something to that. Russia's breaking point in terms of being able to find people um, to mobilize is very, very far from where they currently are. There are obviously political restrictions on those mobilizations. Russia's been very hesitant to actually um, launch into their next uh, large wave of mobilization. So I, th I think one of the reasons for that is probably that we have the the presidential elections coming up in March 2024 in Russia, um, which I imagine after that point, once you know Putin's position has once again been been publicly secured and celebrated, um, there will be a little more appetite to do these controversial things like like have an additional mobilization. Um, in addition to that, when you're talking about the, con the, um, uh, production of defense equipment and, uh, especially munitions, artillery munitions, uh, let's also remember that 2023 is the year where Russia started to import large amounts of North Korean artillery munitions to make up the gaps that it was facing. So both Russia and Ukraine are depending on external sources of, um, that artillery munition keep the guns going. Um, now, something important to be said about that, that artillery munition availability um, uh, competition between the two sides is, is of course, that um, that's perhaps one of the more, the more difficult things that Ukraine is dealing with right now, where during that summer offensive, when they forced that higher level of attrition on Russian forces that included um, uh, larger numbers of Russian artillery being taken out of the battlefield. That advantage seems to have been kind of lost or, or is close to being lost by limitations on availability of artillery munitions on the Ukrainian side, right? So as they take away um, Russian artillery, that means that they relieve pressure on their own artillery systems as the, the potential for counter battery fire is reduced. Uh, but if you don't have the shells to fire, um, that advantage uh, evaporates again. And, and I think that's kind of the, the point where we're at now. So um, so both sides are definitely having having problems in coping with the, uh, the munitions they need. And then especially when we're looking at the more high-end systems that Russia has been trying to use, um, the, uh, the cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, um, we're seeing that Russia really has to um, to ration those to extreme levels. Between the summer of 2023 and just recently around New Year, um, we saw very little of those kind of depth strikes into Ukraine using those kind of ballistic missiles and cruise missiles. Um, Russia now has, again, used a substantial part of the weapons that they stockpiled over the past six months. Um, we'll probably see some additional attacks of that nature in, in the coming weeks and months. Um, but they will have to go back to uh, stockpiling them instead of using them and then using them again when they are available. So they are not able to to keep that pressure up um, at a constant rate. And then that, I, I think that kind of um, behavior is indicative of the, the situation that the Russian military faces across all different types of equipment as well. The, the same type of dynamics we could probably expect to be the case for ground vehicles, um, tanks, artillery systems. Um, Russia has an ability to produce those in, in decent numbers, but they're also facing attrition. So there's there's going to be um, gaps and shortfalls uh, throughout their efforts to actually get forces on the battlefield. So as, essentially to bring that back to what you were saying, saying initially, um, on the short term, when we're talking about the next year or even next three to four years, um, I don't believe that Russia really has the ability to replenish its forces uh, faster than it is actually burning through them on the battlefield. 
Uh, it's deliciously refreshing for me to talk to you about this because usually I'm the optimist and I'm talking to pessimists, but I find myself <laughs> being a pessimist to your optimism. And it's, uh, well, it's, it's not a position I normally put myself in. I'm glad you mentioned North Korea. I had some stats on that. Um, Europe has sent uh, roughly 300,000 shells to Ukraine, uh, according to Lithuania. He's the uh, Lithuanian, I think it was the, hold on, the defense minister? Yes, the, I'm oh, sorry, the foreign minister said that the, the total deliveries of, from EU countries to Ukraine was 300,000 shells. South Korean intelligence says the North Koreans have already sent a million to the Russians. Um, so I often make fun of North Korea when I'm giving talks about how, oh, China, the only ally they have in the world is North Korea. And making the one thing North Korea does is make the types of ammunition cells you need for an attritional fight. Uh, they can't do anything else maybe in the world, but that's what they do. And the North Koreans are literally outproducing all of Europe. Um, you also mentioned sort of the politics. I mean, Putin's election, he, he's fine. Like during the summer, I was thinking, oh my God, Prigozhin, maybe this is the beginning of the end and we're going to have a Romanov type, you know, style demise for Putin or something like that. He's fine. He's rubber stamping his elections. He's doing whatever he wants. We can't say the same for Zelensky. Zelensky, who's, you know, chief of his general staff and his generals are coming out and contradicting him in public and saying, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He's supposed to hold elections this year. He's going to be in the difficult position of whether he holds elections and maybe loses power or tries to declare martial law or something like that or says it's an emergency so we can't have elections and we'll see how the defense establishment goes there so even domestically politically things don't don't look so good for him and i i take your point on russia's inability to keep constant pressure on ukraine with missiles and drones and maybe i mean one one thing i don't know how to explain here is ukraine claims that iran is just supplying russia with all kinds of missiles and drones i don't know how to evaluate the veracity of those things but if you've got iran sitting there they're happy i'm sure to send their experimental missiles over to russia and russia doesn't need them to be that accurate they just want to you know bomb the the ukrainians into submission so you put all of that together it doesn't feel like a very good picture so push back some more to, to tell me why i should be more optimistic well on, on iran we've seen more iranian ballistic missiles fired from yemen towards israel than from russia towards ukraine so far right um there's there's a lot of um, uh, the Iranian drones, the Shahed type drones that we're seeing used by Russia. Um, many of those are also produced locally in Russia under license uh, of, of uh, the Iranian developments. Um, but that's one of the things I've actually been wondering about as well: why we haven't seen uh, those uh, those theater level ballistic missiles that Iran has has focused on developing for for decades. Um, it's one of the one of the main deterrents that they actually position themselves with in the Middle East. Um, we haven't seen those types of of weapons actually show up in uh, in Russia. So I'm, I'm a little bit surprised actually that we saw the the North Koreans um, ballistic missiles appear before the Iranian ones. But that is possibly something that could be coming um, in the future, where um, you know, as as Russia is trying to maintain. Um, some kind of pressure deeper into Ukraine, uh, that, or I, I'm, I might have misspoken countries. I meant to say Russia maintaining that pressure into Ukraine. Um, but uh, essentially, um, you know, those kind of depth strikes, while they are significant in, in terms of uh, effects on, on Ukraine's infrastructure, they are not directly affecting the battlefield, right? A, a missile on a... Um, on an energy plant deep in Ukraine, or even one of the defense uh, factories inside Ukraine, is not going to allow Russian forces to break out on the front line. And um, let me just turn that criticism around the opposite way as well, where a lot of what Ukraine is doing uh, when it gets the the Storm Shadow missiles and, and similar systems, when they are striking um, airfields deep into Crimea, when they are striking um, Russian Navy assets in the Black Sea, that also, of course, is not translating to breakthroughs on the front line, right? So, and, and, and it's, it's an interesting situation where both sides have actually shown a, a similar kind of um, limitation. And, and I've seen both Russian mill bloggers as well as Ukrainian commentators discuss the same issue uh, on their own respective sides of the conflict, um, where the the ability to actually um, coordinate 
all these different levels of warfare, all these different capabilities to coordinate them in such a way that it actually leads to the highest benefit on the battlefield, that is still something that they are both unable to do. Um, and I think, you know, to take my, my optimism on, you know, Russia's dire position in, in maintaining that war of attrition in the longer term, um, to take that optimism into a, a more pessimistic uh, direction. I, I also think that um, there is no reason um, in absence of, of Ukrainian abilities to actually coordinate their means uh, successfully to break through the front lines. Um, there's no reason that uh, Russia would run out of resources to maintain the positions that they currently hold in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Well, so where do we go from here then? So are we, I know that the chief of Ukraine's general staff, I mean, he literally described it like a trench warfare, World War One type scenario where both sides were stuck. And he laid out all the, you know, the, the Christmas list of things he thought Ukraine needed in order to win, which was, they can't even get ammunition shells from, from Europe, let alone fancy drones and fancy missiles and fighter jets and everything else that they're, that they're talking about. So are we just sort of stuck in here's the line it's going to move a little bit back and forth and there there will be missiles but you know some kind of frozen conflict um or do you think that both sides are gearing up for some sort of you know summer offensive 2.0 see if they can't take the lessons from the last year and and push through where, where how are you thinking about how this conflict is going to evolve over the next 12 months so i, I think they haven't run out of options yet right and i think when, when we're talking about the frozen conflict situation uh, that's essentially a situation that emerges when um, there's there's no more options to to change the uh, the battlefield or to change the front line available to Ukraine specifically in the, in this context, right? Um, so as long as there are still some things to try, and and that might seem a little bit um, of an of an amateurish approach, right? That just We'll, we'll throw some stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Um, but, but essentially that's, that's kind of the position we're in. The things that have been tried so far did not work. Um, I think, uh, one of those things that some people are looking at is the, the potential effect of the F-16s being delivered to Ukraine, becoming operational. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not entirely sure just how much of an effect that would have on the conflict as a whole. Um, for the same reasons that I mentioned before, where, um, I, I wonder how much those new capabilities uh, and the different capabilities that the F-16 has, you could use it for a lot of different things, but they might only use it uh, in an air defense capacity, which um, of course adds a lot of value in that domain, but, but still um, leaves a lot of other things that you could achieve with a system like that um, on the table. And um, so yeah, I, I basically I fear that they they won't be able to to actually integrate that into the full operational war plan um, that could potentially um, cause some uh, some shifts, some you know, perhaps a breakout in the Kherson region or or putting pressure on on Russian forces somewhere else along the front line to to cause those forces to finally break. Um, no, I, I don't think the F-16 is the only thing that, that all of this is is, um, is hanging on. Um, I think one of the, the lessons or the, the types of lessons that Ukrainians also learned uh, in their attempt at the summer offensive was how they could actually try to coordinate these larger armored forces uh, that they obtained through all the different deliveries from the West um, in trying to break through heavily defended fortified mined positions. Um, and I think, you know, new procedures, new processes have come out of that, that hopefully, um, once the winter is over, will lead to some renewed attempts, some, some different ways in trying to achieve those breakthroughs. Um, I'm not saying that's, that's necessarily likely, but I, I think that's something that will be tried. Um, so I think at least for the coming year, there's going to be that, um, influx of some new elements, uh, some experimentation that will keep the conflict going. Now, if we're talking about a longer term at this point, if we're talking about, you know, five years ahead, what does a conflict look like? Will it necessarily have changed? Will Ukraine reach the Russian border and um, liberate its entire territory? Um, I, I don't think we can make a call on that. I, I think that's um, that optimism that we saw after 2022 
when the the Ukrainian capabilities against the the Russian military and especially the way that the Russian military was, was fighting at that time, um, I think that's all out the window, right? We we don't. Um, uh, I, I don't think anyone can realistically expect those kind of massive rapid gains um, that that we saw back then. So. Um, is it possible that this falls into a frozen conflict? I could, I could definitely see it happen um, in a similar way to, um, you know, 2015 after the initial um, outbreak of hostilities in, in eastern Ukraine. While while it wasn't with as many uh, as many forces as it is now, um, we saw kind of a similar situation where the maneuver warfare um, reached a point where there was no more benefit to be gotten. The petition, the positions were becoming more and more static and both sides kind of reduced their um their activity over time because there there was more effort going into these attempts to break the front line than benefit being gotten from it right and uh i i could definitely see that happen again but i think for now there's still um there's still some room to try and shake things up well this is why the longer the war goes on the 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 less likely it seems to me that Ukraine is going to have success because say what you will about Russia, Vladimir Putin is in charge. He has organized the Russian economy around being a war machine now and creating the things that Russia needs on the front lines with Ukraine. You can't say the same thing about Ukraine. Ukraine is having struggles within its own government. Um, you know, the EU is talking once again about corruption, like how, how many of the dollars that have been put into Ukraine have actually gone towards producing the things that Ukraine needs versus how many have gone into the pockets of oligarchs. You don't have a dictator in Ukraine, um, sort of the pitfall of, of democracy here when you're in a conflict against a, a power like Russia, which is just going to continue to grind things out. Um, Maybe, I don't know, maybe if Zelensky resigns or is forced to resign or something like that, Putin can declare, you know, mission accomplished. He got rid of the, whatever he was calling, the, he was calling them fascists or whatever. I, I can't, it's, it's ridiculous, but. Um, well, I, I feel like when we're talking about Zelensky's role in that way in Ukraine, I, I feel like there's an underlying assumption being made that, um, the interests of Ukraine or the, the approach to the conflict of Ukraine, which is trying to reconquer or to liberate the occupied portions of Ukraine, that that is a policy that is um, linked to Zelensky, but not to other Ukrainian leaders. And I don't think that's the case. I, um, I'm, I'm fairly confident, um, even though I'm, I'm these days not as focused on, on the Ukrainian politics, I'm, I'm not quite sure who the different um, uh, the different factions are that would be trying to replace Zelensky and where they stand on things. But I, I would be very surprised if anyone replaced Zelensky and then just said like, oh, well, now let's just surrender. Of course. It's not about that, but it's about... Uh, it doesn't seem to me that Putin can freeze the conflict um, if Zelensky is still president. But if you got somebody who was not Zelensky in, he could say, oh, there was regime change in Ukraine. We've changed the government in Ukraine. It's now not a, it's not a bunch of fascist thugs. We've liberated you know, Russians from the eastern part of Ukraine. We can pause here and build tanks for the next two years, and <laughs> we'll see you in two years once we're ready to roll. <laughs> but the conflict doesn't end when Russia pauses it. It, it ends when both sides pause it, right? It's, fair, fair it's not entirely in Russia's hands how long this conflict lasts. And I would say in at some level... Um, if Russia were able to retain the territory that it currently held, it would probably already consider that a a victory or something they can try to paint as a victory. While from the Ukrainian side, I, I think that it's it's much harder to actually accept the current uh, situation and and try and sell that off as a uh, as a successful defense or, or something like that. I, I I think the urge would be much greater on Ukraine, regardless of who's in charge. To actually keep the conflict going now the big the, the big qualifier in in being able to do so of course lies outside of ukraine and i think that's where the whole you know russia's ability to to continue fighting this war of attrition um versus ukrainian capabilities i think that comes down much more to the level of western support that ukraine can continue to uh to receive because um even though you know we've talked about the the numbers of um, 
artillery shells that are coming from from Europe. And even though those numbers are too low, um, there are still ongoing programs and efforts by Germany and France to to come up with the additional numbers of ammunition shells that have been promised. Um, there's there's been some large contracts placed with defense companies in France, uh, uh, at least in France, uh, probably in some other countries as well, um, that have not yet made it to Ukraine. But those those numbers are eventually going to be coming um, when we're talking about the F-16s, the training of Ukrainian ground forces, all those kind of initiatives. At this point, they are still going and they are keeping Ukraine in the fight and able to actually um, try to try to um, rejuvenate, I guess, their their uh, ability on the battlefield to uh, to break through Russian front lines. Um, but I think when we're talking about that that Western support as a whole over the next year, there are going to be some very interesting decision points. And one major one, obviously, is the US election near the end of the year, um, which I guess won't change a lot on, on the US policy um, in the beginning of the year. But, you know, if we're talking by the end of the year into the next presidency uh, next year, that's that could potentially have massive effects on, on what's happening there, depending on who wins that election. Um, and then, of course, in Europe, there's elections, too. I'm, I'm not entirely certain that those would necessarily change the attitudes. But the United Kingdom, for example, has uh, has been one of the main um, supporters of Ukraine in Europe. And um, they're also having an election uh, in 2024. I, f I forgot when exactly, but they they. Um, they're holding early elections, right? So at the very least, we could potentially see the the um, the campaigning efforts cause some um, some turbulence in in how Europe is dealing with Ukraine, right? So um, so those uncertainties around what the West is willing to do to keep Ukraine in the fight, I think, are going to be much more decisive than the Ukrainian politics, actually. Yeah, I mean, polling data suggests that that, that, that support is on a steady decline. Um, and part of that is just this, again, the longer the war goes on, the more that the world gets sort of used to it. It, it becomes background, background noise. We start talking about the Red Sea, or we start talking about Israel and Gaza, or we talk about whatever other thing is going to happen in the world. Um, do you have a view on, on what happens if Trump wins in the United States? Do you think that that would be catastrophic for Ukraine? Or do you think that, that Trump would keep up support? I, I honestly have no idea. And in, in my mind, Trump is the is the wild card. Um, on the one hand, I would not be surprised if Trump decides that he has to be opposite of what came before him. So because the previous administration supported Ukraine, he has to be against that support. Um, I could see him leaning towards Russia as he has done on certain topics in the past. And, and all of those things cause him uh, to at least significantly reduce that support, or he could see himself as the big deal maker that comes in and forces Ukraine into um, uh, into a, um, a a ceasefire agreement with Russia, um, accepting loss of territory, those kind of things. But on the other hand, him being a wild card, I could also see him, you know, depending on which influence he is catching from from whom at any certain point, um, he might go completely gung-ho and unleash certain military technologies that Ukraine has not been getting from the US. So who knows? Um, but I, I think at the very least, it it brings uncertainty. And uh, the fact that, that that possibility is very real, um, it, I mean, I think... You know, not an expert on US politics, but I think so far things are looking for another Biden versus Trump election and, and I think at, at this point that's difficult to kind of project who will actually come out on top and um, Ukraine knows this is happening um, Europe knows this is happening they also know in Europe that if the US drops out of this game um, whatever Europe continues to provide to Ukraine is going to be much much less significant um, in the long run uh, so in a way uh, everybody that's looking at how much they want to commit to the fight in Ukraine, they are looking at what might happen with that that U.S. support. And if the U.S. support falls through or, or doesn't come through in the end, um, I, I think that puts Ukraine in a very, very weak position. 
Have you seen any signs that that is affecting what Ukraine wants to do on the battlefield? Like, is, is there a timer in Zelensky's head or in the general's head that, hey, we, we have until U.S. elections where we are sure of what kind of support we're getting from the United States. So we need to do X, Y, and Z before then, or can you not draw a straight line between those things? Um, I've not heard specific statements on the the U.S. elections. Um, I mean, obviously, people talk about Trump and and how um, how he might affect the the battlefield or the availability of equipment um, that Ukraine needs on the battlefield. Um, there are always these occasional deadlines, much shorter than than a year from now. Um, that people get hooked on. I, I remember during the summer offensive, there were certain deadlines um, related to assessments of, of Russia's ability to fight where, where people were saying, you know, if we don't end this war by November, there is no ending it um, or, or there is no winning it anymore. But now we're past November and that, that attitude has not stuck, right? So people are obviously going to... Um, make up these kind of uh, ultimatums or or something like that um but in the end like on on the ground people continue to fight and then they will continue to fight as long as they have the means to do so um so i, I think it's an, until the actual material support dries up um I, I don't expect that to to have a a massive change fair enough well um to, to wrap up this part of the conversation. So what is your most likely scenario for 2024 when we're sitting here across from each other in January, 2025, what do you think we're talking about? Do you think much is going to change? I mean, I know we can't like, there's a lot of uncertainties out there, but what's your most likely scenario or base case at this point? I mean, and th this is where the pessimism comes up again. If I really have to make a call and, and say, um, what is the most likely case out of the, the different, scenarios then then I, i'm afraid we might be having the same conversation that we're having now um we we might be we might have less future options to talk about at that point um you know the the longer this kind of stasis continues on the front lines um the less of those those future potential or f future options are going to be available um so i i yeah, that's my my big fear, and I, I think it it, it does have a, a very high likelihood uh, of happening that way. But I think there are some uh, some perspectives, some other scenarios, and it's difficult to mark them as the the scenario of the highest likelihood because it requires a lot of different elements, a lot of different um, gears to fall in the, into the exact right place for things to play out that way. But um, I think if Ukraine is able to actually um, bring the things that they are getting from the West together in a coherent capability in a way that, you know, things like the Storm Shadows, the F-16s, the artillery munitions, that they are able to actually distribute or concentrate those in such a way that they are able to, to make some meaningful gains. I, I wouldn't say that it's impossible that next year we're talking about Oh, so now Russia made it to the edge of Crimea. That changes things. Um, that's that's one possible thing we could be talking about. But it requires a lot of things to happen just right. Um, and the first of those things to happen just right, of course, is the the Western support to keep going. And that means that the debates in the European uh, uh, Parliament, the the debates in U.S. Congress, um, those need to actually be resolved and the the support to ukraine needs to be clear um needs to be decided you know what is it going to include what is it not going to include um for example those kind of debates on on ata cms which we've we've talked about numerous times in in, in the previous uh, episodes i was on um that's still something where it, it, it's not really clear whether that is something that the administration has greenlit or not or um, it, you know, those, those kind of things are, are causing, uh, big problems in, in Ukraine being able to actually plan what they are trying to do and how they are trying to bring together those capabilities. Yeah. Um, maybe let's, you know, we've spent a good half hour on, on Russian Ukraine. Um, I'm curious if, if you have any thoughts about the Red Sea Our one of our last podcasts about it, I was, I was voicing some some pretty serious concern about what's going on in the Middle East. I'm sort of shocked that we're here 
almost, I mean, almost three months from October 7th and 8th and everything that happened around that time period. And the U S is sort of, um, you know, not doing, not, not, not coming in really strong and opening up Red Sea shipping and things like that. Um, did you have any sense of, or, or I'm, I'm curious what your level of concern is about the Red Sea in general and whether and how that conflict connects back to Russia and Russia and Ukraine? Because obviously you've got Iran there too. And when you start to put all the pieces together, like all of these things are, are interconnected. So are, are you concerned there or, or do you think it's kind of a much ado about nothing? Help me figure that out. Well, I'm, I'm actually mostly surprised about the way that the, um, the West, you know, NATO countries, we, we keep talking about this, um, this vague entity, uh, the West, but it is of course, primarily the U S and its NATO allies. But, um, I, I am a bit surprised by the, the seemingly weak approach that they have taken to the, the threat coming out of Yemen. Um, so it seems like right now, the emphasis of their response is on protecting vessels at sea using missile defense capabilities of those vessels, uh, air defense capabilities of those vessels, of course, not, not just missile defense, um, and the ability to intervene against, um, vessels that are trying to board, um, commercial vessels. So, um, it, it's essentially a, a, uh, a copy of the, the anti-piracy response from back in 2008, 2009, um, with an added missile defense and air defense aspect to it. Um, which is a little surprising to me because we're not talking about this kind of distributed low intensity threat that, that piracy was at the time. We're talking about a military actor in Yemen, the particularly the, the Houthis and, and other factions aligned with them, um, that have a presence on the ground that you can actually hit. Um, so firing these kind of missiles, both the missiles that they are launching at, uh, Israel, as well as the missiles that they are launching at, at commercial vessels, um, they require staging areas. They require meteorological stations. They require, uh, radar systems in some cases. So, um, those are all things that you can take out and that would not be unprecedented. Um, that's actually something that the U S has done in the past. Um, the exact year, I think 2016, um, when, um, the Houthis actually started to launch some anti-ship missiles, um, at vessels in the Red Sea. Um, it, it didn't take that long for the U S to, to just take out the three radar stations on the coastline that were feeding the targeting data for those missiles. And, and the crisis was over. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm a little surprised and, and how, how weak that response is. It, it feels like a, the kind of response where they are they're hoping things to quiet down without having to commit too much doing doing the minimum to guarantee some level of safety um but at the same time um you know that also leaves some potential for uh for um for an, an additional long-term cost to emerge from that because if, if um if things don't die down then you haven't committed the initial cost that it would have taken to actually cut it down from the start. Well, I mean, it's not working. Like shipping companies are, are, go, are going around Africa now and, you know, clients that I'm talking to are, are very concerned. Is, is there any way to draw a link between what's been happening in the Sahel and what, and the U S willingness and ability to do these operations? You know, for instance, I know in Niger, the U S had an air base where a lot of drones that were active in the region and things like that were supposed to be based. I don't know how they're probably not flying a lot of missions out of any Niger air base after the coup and things like that. Is, is there any sense that this is a capability constraint that they don't have friendly countries or the usual basing requirements that they, that they have before, or maybe Saudi Arabia is telling them, Hey, like, no, absolutely not. Don't do this. We're not interested in this right now um or is that a bridge too far I, I don't think it's a capability issue um keep in mind that we have Djibouti just across the water um both the French and the, the U.S. Air Force have a, have a substantial presence or an ability to operate a substantial um task force out of Djibouti so that's um that's I, I don't think that's a problem um the bigger problem might be what you're alluding to uh, about potentially Saudi Arabia saying Let, let's not do this. I, I'm not sure if Saudi Arabia would be the one holding a hand over to Houthis and saying like, hey, let's let's uh, play nice with these guys. 
Um, but uh, I, I think it's possible that there are some concerns about how the role and the posture of the US and other Western armed forces in a conflict that is still being characterized um, at its essence as a the Arab-Israeli conflict, um, that that could harm uh, relations with other countries. So um, if, you know, even though if, we're, if we isolate this as Houthis threaten commercial shipping in the Red Sea, the West responds to that threat, that's, that's a very clean little operation that you could do, a very clean objective to achieve. The reality is that the world public is going to translate that into um, U.S. Air Force and, and NATO Air Forces come to the aid of Israel, right? Uh, and, and that makes it a little, uh, a little more electorally sensitive in the West itself, as well as, of course, sensitive in relations between those Western countries and um, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, all, all countries in the region, which themselves are, are facing significant difficulties in, in balancing their own relations with Israel versus those with um, with Palestine, with uh, Lebanon, with Yemen. With Yemen. So um, it, it's definitely not an easy situation to, to kind of just go in and say, oh, we're, we're just going to do this. But in a purely mechanical sense, I, I think there's, there's options there that are not being um, used right now. Hmm. Um, last question for you, and it's okay if the answer to this is uh, no, th 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 those are the main conflicts, but you know, everybody knows about Russia and Ukraine now, everybody knows about the Red Sea and the Middle East War. Um, I'm curious what oxygen those conflicts are sucking out of the room. Are there any other hotspots around the world that you are focused on that you feel like aren't getting their due? Any you know, wars or, or conflict zones that you think when we're looking back 12 months from now, we should have known that that was brewing because all the signals were there. It was just, we were distracted with other things. Um, is there anything like that on your radar? Any, I won't call them black swans because you, you can't imagine a black swan, but what, what are the, you know, worst case scenarios or the, or the things that you're worried about in 2024 that you think nobody else is worried about, or are you optimistic? That's an answer too. Um, I mean, it's hard to say, you know, I, I'd be being optimistic depending on how those conflicts evolve. The, the reality is, is there are, there's always going to be multiple conflicts going on in the world and um, pro probably not cause for celebration. Um, but I mean, in terms of what you're looking for, there's something that we're ignoring that could kind of jump up as a big problem or something like that in, in 2024. Um, I'm not quite sure about something to highlight in, in that context. And I'm, I'm sure that something will pop up in 2024 that we haven't talked about. Um, there's, there's always bound to be something the, the fact that I'm saying now that I can't think of one guarantees that there will be one. Um, right. but, uh, I, I think what you were mentioning earlier in, in terms of Niger, um, and we've, we've talked about this in one of the past episodes as well. Um, I think the situation in general around Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, um, that, that continues to be a situation that, um, that is left festering, that is, is um, going to require um, some kind of address at some point in the future. Um, and I'm, I'm not thinking that's going to lead to anything drastic or, or volatile in, in the next year per se, but um, but in the longer term, there's there's bound to be problems coming out of that, um, that situation. And by, and by that situation, just to be clear to those that are not familiar with it. We're, we're talking about the, the different coups that have taken place, the military governments that are leading Mali, Niger, and um, and Burkina Faso, but especially the fact that those military juntas have driven out uh, Western military actors, uh, which has significantly reduced the pressure on jihadist groups um, operating in the, in the region. And we're already seeing that uh, since the coup in Niger took place, um, jihadist attacks are definitely on the rise. Um, again, at this point, this is, this is not at a level where it directly threatens Europe or the United States in any kind of meaningful way. But, um, you know, we, we, we've, we've seen what that could emerge into back in 2013 when, um, you know, the fallout from, from Libya led to the, the massive expansion of, of jihadist groups in, in Northern Mali, setting up their own, uh, quasi caliphate. Um, so things like that could, could happen at some point. I'm not going to call it for 2024, but, 
Um, but yeah, at, at some point we need to take a, a, a deep look at ourselves and, and how we can deal with that situation um, or things will get out of hand eventually. You heard it here first, folks. Go long jihad in 2024. <laughs> <laughs> Good Lord. I'm not sure that's what I meant. <laughs> No, it's okay. I'm, I'm tongue in cheek. Um, I did want to ask you, uh, you know, Venezuela has been making a lot of noise about Guyana recently. Yes. I have no frame of reference for whether Venezuela has functioning military forces. Does the Venezuelan, does a Venezuelan military threat bother you at all? Um, or do you think that that is something that you can dismiss? It's a very interesting, uh, thought exercise. Um, uh, one, yeah. I won't go too deep into uh, some some of the thinking I was doing earlier, but um, for for different reasons, I was I was looking into the um, um, the the planning and and uh, contingency planning uh, leading to the U.S. intervention in Panama um, back in um, uh, eighty nine, eighty eight, no eighty nine, right? Um, and uh, uh, so when when this stuff in Venezuela started to happen, that that was one of the first things that kind of uh, came to mind because obviously it's the same combatant command that would be responsible for any kind of intervention um, in in South America. Um, but the interesting thing that I uh, conclusion I guess that I kind of came to <clears throat> in, in talking to other people about this as well is that I don't think there's a very high likelihood of anyone being able to effectively intervene in Guyana to, to keep, um, to keep Venezuela from occupying some additional territory. Um, because the reality is that when you, when you look at this in a, in a geographical sense, it's very difficult to access this part of the world. The, the only real way that you would have to get to that part of Guyana is coming in from the coast. Um, you know, countries like Brazil, even though, um, they they are you know near they are a bordering country they're not going to be marching an army through the middle of the uh of the jungle to to get to the coastline of guiana which is you know kind of where things are um so air power is one thing that could play a part there that's that's something that you can easily project um over the the treetops in uh, in south america but the reality is that in the end, you're going to need some kind of boots on the ground to actually establish control to claim uh, presence. So if if Venezuela is able to do that coming in from along the coast, um, then I'm not sure who would be able to come in to force Venezuela out. And um, I'm, I'm hearing a large U.S. audience getting up on their chair and screaming at me like, obviously, that's what the Marines were made for. Um, but <laughs> conducting a co contested landing of the U.S. Marine Force in Guyana to kick out the Venezuelans, that seems to me like a very, a very risky option for a very limited gain or very limited impact. So I, I think at this point, Venezuela, like Guyana, might be for the taking. Like if, if Venezuela really wants to do it, I think they they probably can. Um, I'm not entirely sure why uh, they are suddenly. Uh, doing this, but perhaps it's mostly supposed to be kind of a, a national rallying point or something like that. But, um, but I think if they want to roll into Guyana, I, I think there's very little that could happen from the outside to, to physically stop them. Huh. Well, the answer is oil. And the second question is, I mean, forgive the ignorance. Do the Brazilians have Marines? I mean, maybe they don't want to march an army through the the, the rainforest or the jungle, but can't they just get on boats and go around to the coast and do something there? Or do they don't, they don't have the kind of expeditionary force to do that? Well, they, let's put it this way. The, the U S Marine Corps, um, is the, the best trained fighting force in the world world when it comes to these kind of amphibious operations. There's, there's no doubt about that uh, at scale. The, these are the only guys that do this kind of stuff. Um, so most countries in the world, including Brazil, have some type of naval infantry and things like that. But actually conducting a contested landing, which with a force of multiple brigades or something like that, and then being able to actually sustain those forces in combat, that's a very, very intense logistical expeditionary exercise um, that I, yeah, I don't, I don't think Brazil is prepared for that. All right. Well, there's some 
some unpleasant food for thought. Sim, uh, we'll have you back soon. Thanks as always for making the time. It's good to see you and hope the year starts off good, man. Thanks, you too. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidence podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor.